tiredly, following one another, they went up the great stairway, turning out lights behind them. "'Has everyone got a flashlight, by the way?' the doctor asked, and they nodded, more intent upon sleep than the waves of darkness which came up after them up the stairs of Hill House. "'Good night, everyone,' Eleanor said, opening the door to the blue room. "'Good night,' Luke said. "'Good night,' Theodora said. "'Good night,' the doctor said. "'Sleep tight.' "'Coming, mother, coming,' Eleanor said, fumbling for the light. "'It's all right, I'm coming.' "'Eleanor,' she heard. "'Eleanor, coming, coming,' she shouted irritably. "'Just a minute, I'm coming.' "'Eleanor?' "'Then she thought, with a crashing shock which brought her awake, "'cold and shivering, out of bed and awake, "'I am in Hill House.' "'What?' she cried out. "'What? Theodora? Eleanor, in here. Coming?' "'No time for the light. "'She kicked a table out of the way, "'wandering at the noise of it "'and struggling briefly with the door of the connecting bathroom.' That is not the table falling, she thought. My mother is knocking on the wall. It was blessedly light in Theodora's room, and Theodora was sitting up in bed, her hair tangled from sleep and her eyes wide with the shock of awakening. I must look the same way, Eleanor thought and said, I'm here, what is it? And then heard, clearly for the first time, although she had been hearing it ever since she awakened, What is it? she whispered. She sat down slowly on the foot of Theodora's bed, wondering at what seemed calmness in herself. Now, she thought, now, it is only a noise and terribly cold, terribly, terribly cold. It is a noise down the hall, far down at the end, near the nursery door, and terribly cold. Not my mother knocking on the wall. Something is knocking on the doors, Theodora said in a tone of pure rationality. That's all, and it's down near the other end of the hall. Luke and the doctor are probably there already to see what's going on. Not at all like my mother knocking on the wall. I was dreaming again. Bang, bang, Theodora said. Bang, Eleanor said and giggled. I am calm, she thought, but so very cold. The noise is only a kind of banging on the doors, one after the other. Is this what I was so afraid of? Bang is the best word for it. It sounds like something children do, not mothers knocking against the wall for help. And anyway, Luke and the doctor are there. Is this what they mean by cold chills going up and down your back? Because it is not pleasant. It starts in your stomach and goes in waves around and up and down again like something alive. Like something alive. Yes, like something alive. Theodora, she said, and closed her eyes and tightened her teeth together and wrapped her arms around herself. He's getting closer. Just a noise, Theodora said and moved next to Eleanor and sat tight against her. It has an echo. It sounded, Eleanor thought, like a hollow noise. A hollow bang, as though something were hitting the doors with an iron kettle or an iron bar or an iron glove. It pounded regularly for a minute and then suddenly more softly, and then again in a quick flurry, seeming to be going methodically from door to door at the end of the hall. Distantly, she thought she could hear the voices of Luke and the doctor calling from somewhere below, and she thought, Then they are not up here with us at all, and heard the iron crashing against what must have been a door very close. Maybe it will go on down the other side of the hall, Theodora whispered, and Eleanor thought that the oddest part of this indescribable experience was that Theodora should be having it too. No, Theodora said, and they heard the crash against the door across the hall. It was louder. It was deafening. It struck against the door next to them. Did it move back and forth across the hall? Did it go on feet along the carpet? Did it lift a hand to the door? And Eleanor threw herself away from the bed and ran to hold her hands against the door. Go away, she shouted wildly. Go away, go away! There was complete silence, and Eleanor thought, standing with her face against the door, Now I've done it. It was looking for the room with someone inside. The cold crept and pinched at them, filling and overflowing the room. Anyone would have thought that the inhabitants of Hill House slept sweetly in this quiet, and then, so suddenly that Eleanor wheeled around, the sound of Theodora's teeth chattering, and Eleanor laughed. You big baby, she said. I'm cold, Theodora said. Deadly cold. So am I. Eleanor took the green quilt and threw it around Theodora, and took up Theodora's warm dressing gown and put it on. You warmer now? Where's Luke? Where's the doctor? I don't know. Are you warmer now? No, Theodora shivered. In a minute I'll go out in the hall and call them. Are you... It started again.
as though it had been listening, waiting to hear their voices and what they said, to identify them, to know how well prepared they were against it, waiting to hear if they were afraid, so suddenly that Eleanor leaped back against the bed and Theodora gasped and cried out. The iron crash came against their door and both of them lifted their eyes in horror because the hammering was against the upper edge of the door, higher than either of them could reach, higher than Luke or the doctor could reach, and the sickening, degrading cold came in waves from whatever was outside the door. Eleanor stood perfectly still and looked at the door. She did not quite know what to do, although she believed that she was thinking coherently and was not unusually frightened, not more frightened, certainly, than she had believed in her worst dream she could be. The cold troubled her even more than the sounds. Even Theodora's warm robe was useless against the icy little curls of fingers on her back. The intelligent thing to do, perhaps, was to walk over and open the door. That, perhaps, would belong with the doctor's views of pure scientific inquiry. Eleanor knew that even if her feet would take her as far as the door, her hand would not lift to the doorknob. Impartially, remotely, she told herself that no one's hand would touch that knob. It's not the work hands were made for, she told herself. She had been rocking a little, each crash against the door pushing her a little backward, and now she was still, because the noise was fading. I'm going to complain to the janitor about the radiators, Theodora said from behind her. Is it stopping? No, Eleanor said, sick. No. It had found them. Since Eleanor would not open the door, it was going to make its own way in. Eleanor said aloud, Now I know why people scream, because I think I'm going to. And Theodora said, I will if you will, and laughed, so that Eleanor turned quickly back to the bed and they held each other, listening in silence. Little pattings came from around the door frame, small, seeking sounds, feeling the edges of the door, trying to sneak away in. The doorknob was fondled, and Eleanor, whispering, asked, Is it locked? And Theodora nodded, and then, wide-eyed, turned to stare at the connecting bathroom door. Mine's locked too, Eleanor said against her ear, and Theodora closed her eyes in relief. The little sticky sounds moved on around the door frame, and then, as though a fury caught whatever was outside, the crashing came again, and Eleanor and Theodora saw the wood of the door tremble and shake and the door move against its hinges. "'You can't get in,' Eleanor said wildly, and again there was a silence, as though the house listened with attention to her words, understanding, cynically agreeing, content to wait. A thin little giggle came in a breath of air through the room. A little mad rising laugh, the smallest whisper of a laugh, and Eleanor heard it all up and down her back. A little gloating laugh moving past them around the house, and then she heard the doctor and Luke calling from the stairs, and, mercifully, it was over. When the real silence came, Eleanor breathed shakily and moved stiffly. We've been clutching each other like a couple of lost children, Theodora said, and untwined her arms from around Eleanor's neck. You're wearing my bathrobe. I forgot mine. Is it really over? For tonight, anyway, Theodora spoke with certainty. Can't you tell? Aren't you warm again? The sickening cold was gone, except for a reminiscent little thrill of it down Eleanor's back when she looked at the door. She began to pull at the tight knot she had put in the bathroom cord and said, Intense cold is one of the symptoms of shock. Intense shock is one of the symptoms I've got, Theodora said. Here come Luke and the doctor. Their voices were outside in the hall, speaking quickly, anxiously, and Eleanor dropped Theodora's robe on the bed and said, For heaven's sake, don't let them knock on that door. One more knock would finish me, and ran into her own room to get her own robe. Behind her, she could hear Theodora telling them to wait a minute, and then going to unlock the door, and Luke's voice was saying pleasantly to Theodora, why, you look as though you've seen a ghost. When Eleanor came back, she noticed that both Luke and the doctor were dressed, and it occurred to her that it might be a sound idea from now on. If that intense cold was going to come back at night, it was going to find Eleanor sleeping in a wool suit and a heavy sweater. And she didn't care what Mrs. Dudley was going to say when she found that at least one of the lady guests was lying in one of the clean beds in heavy shoes and wool socks. Well, she asked, how do you gentlemen like living in a haunted house? It's perfectly fine, Luke said. Perfectly fine. It gives me an excuse to have a drink in the middle of the night. 
He had the brandy bottle and glasses, and Eleanor thought that they must make a companionable little group, the four of them sitting around Theodora's room at four in the morning drinking brandy. They spoke lightly, quickly, and gave one another fast, hidden little curious glances, each of them wondering what secret terror had been tapped in the others, what changes might show in face or gesture, what unguarded weakness might have opened the way to ruin. Did anything happen in here while we were outside? the doctor asked. Eleanor and Theodora looked at each other and laughed, honestly at last, without any edge of hysteria or fear. After a minute, Theodora said carefully, Nothing in particular. Someone knocked on the door with a cannonball and then tried to get in and eat us and started laughing its head off when we wouldn't open the door, but nothing really out of the way. Curiously, Eleanor went over and opened the door. I thought the whole door was going to shatter, she said, bewildered. And there isn't even a scratch on the wood, nor on any of the other doors. They're perfectly smooth. How nice that it didn't mar the woodwork, Theodora said, holding her brandy glass out to Luke. I couldn't bear it if this dear old house got hurt, she grinned at Eleanor. Nelly here was going to scream. So were you? Not at all. I only said so to keep you company. Besides, Mrs. Dudley already said she wouldn't come. And where were you, our manly defenders? We were chasing a dog, Luke said. At least some animal like a dog. He stopped and then went on reluctantly. We followed it outside. Theodora stared and Eleanor said, You mean it was inside? I saw it run past my door, the doctor said. Just caught a glimpse of it slipping along. I woke Luke and we followed it down the stairs and out into the garden and lost it somewhere back of the house. The front door was open? No, Luke said. The front door was closed. So were all the other doors. We checked. We've been wandering around for quite a while, the doctor said. We never dreamed that you ladies were awake until we heard your voices, he spoke gravely. There is one thing we have not taken into account, he said. They looked at him puzzled, and he explained, checking on his fingers in his lecture style. First, he said, Luke and I were awakened earlier than you ladies, clearly. We've been up and about, outside and in for better than two hours, led on what you perhaps might allow me to call a wild goose chase. Second, neither of us, he glanced inquiringly at Luke as he spoke, heard any sound up here until your voices began. It was perfectly quiet. That is, the sound which hammered on your door was not audible to us. When we gave up our vigil and decided to come upstairs, we apparently drove away whatever was waiting outside your door. Now, as we sit here together... All is quiet. I still don't see what you mean, Theodora said, frowning. We must take precautions, he said. Against what? How? When Luke and I are called outside, and you two are kept imprisoned inside, doesn't it begin to seem, and his voice was very quiet, doesn't it begin to seem that the intention is somehow to separate us? Looking at herself in the mirror with the bright morning sunlight freshening even the blue room of Hill House, Eleanor thought, It is my second morning in Hill House, and I am unbelievably happy. Journeys end in lovers' meeting. I have spent an all but sleepless night. I have told lies and made a fool of myself, and the very air tastes like wine. I have been frightened half out of my foolish wits, but I have somehow earned this joy. I have been waiting for it for so long. Abandoning a lifelong belief that to name happiness is to dissipate it, she smiled at herself in the mirror and told herself silently, You are happy, Eleanor. You have finally been given a part of your measure of happiness. Looking away from her own face in the mirror, she thought blindly, Journeys end in lovers meeting. Lovers meeting. Luke! It was Theodora calling outside in the hall. You carried off one of my stockings last night and you're a thieving cad and I hope Mrs. Dudley can hear me. Eleanor could hear Luke faintly answering. He protested that a gentleman had a right to keep the favours bestowed upon him by a lady and he was absolutely certain that Mrs. Dudley could hear every word. Eleanor! Now Theodora pounded on the connecting door. Are you awake? May I come in? Come, of course, Eleanor said, looking at her own face in the mirror. You deserve it, she told herself. You have spent your life earning it. 
Theodora opened the door and said happily, How pretty you look this morning, my Nell. This curious life agrees with you. Eleanor smiled at her. The life clearly agreed with Theodora, too. We ought by rights to be walking around with dark circles under our eyes and a look of wild despair, Theodora said, putting an arm around Eleanor and looking into the mirror beside her. And look at us, two blooming, fresh young lovelies. I'm thirty-four years old, Eleanor said and wondered what obscure defiance made her add two years. And you'd look about fourteen, Theodora said. Come along, we've earned our breakfast. Laughing, they raced down the great staircase and found their way through the game room and into the dining room. Good morning, Luke said brightly. And how did everyone sleep? Delightfully, thank you, Eleanor said, like a baby. There may have been a little noise, Theodora said. But one has to expect that in these old houses. Doctor, what do we do this morning? Hmm, said the doctor, looking up. He alone looked tired, but his eyes were lighted with the same brightness they found all in one another. It is excitement, Eleanor thought. We are all enjoying ourselves. The Leakin House, the doctor said, savouring his words. Borley Rectory, Glam's Castle. It is incredible to find oneself experiencing it. Absolutely incredible. I could not have believed it. I begin to understand dimly the remote delight of your true medium. I think I shall have the marmalade if you would be so kind. Thank you. My wife will never believe me. Food has a new flavour. Do you find it so? It isn't just that Mrs. Dudley has surpassed herself, then. I was wondering, Luke said. I've been trying to remember... Eleanor said, about last night, I mean, I can remember knowing that I was frightened, but I can't imagine actually being frightened. I remember the cold, Theodora said and shivered. I think it's because it was so unreal by any pattern of thought I'm used to. I mean, it just didn't make sense. Eleanor stopped and laughed, embarrassed. I agree, Luke said. I found myself this morning telling myself what had happened last night. The reverse of a bad dream, as a matter of fact, where you keep telling yourself that it didn't really happen. I thought it was exciting, Theodora said. The doctor lifted a warning finger. It is perfectly possible that it is still all caused by subterranean waters. Then more houses ought to be built over secret springs, Theodora said. The doctor frowned. This excitement troubles me, he said. It is intoxicating, certainly, but might it not also be dangerous? An effect of the atmosphere of Hill House? The first sign that we have, as it were, fallen under a spell? Then I will be an enchanted princess, Theodora said. And yet, Luke said, if last night is a true measure of Hill House, we are not going to have much trouble. We were frightened, certainly, and found the experience unpleasant while it was going on, and yet I cannot remember that I felt any physical danger. Even Theodora telling that whatever was outside her door was coming to eat her did not really sound... I know what she meant, Eleanor said, because I thought it was exactly the right word. The sense was that it wanted to consume us, take us into itself, make us a part of the house, maybe. Oh, dear, I thought I knew what I was saying, but I'm doing it very badly. No physical danger exists, the doctor said positively. No ghost in all the long histories of ghosts has ever hurt anyone physically. The only damage done is by the victim to himself. One cannot even say that the ghost attacks the mind, because the mind, the conscious thinking mind, is invulnerable. In all our conscious minds, as we sit here talking, there is not one iota of belief in ghosts. Not one of us, even after last night, can say the word ghost without a little involuntary smile. No, the menace of the supernatural is that it attacks where modern minds are weakest, where we have abandoned our protective armour of superstition and have no substitute defence. Not one of us thinks rationally that what ran through the garden last night was a ghost and what knocked on the door was a ghost, and yet there was certainly something going on in Hill House last night, and the mind's instinctive refuge, self-doubt, is eliminated. We cannot say it was my imagination because three other people were there too. I could say, Eleanor put in, smiling, all three of you are in my imagination. None of this is real. If I thought you could really believe that, the doctor said gravely, I would turn you out of Hill House this morning. You would be venturing far too close to the state of mind which would welcome the perils of Hill House with a kind of sisterly embrace. He means he would think you were batty, Nell, dear. Well, Eleanor said, I expect I would be. 
If I had to take sides with Hill House against the rest of you, I would expect you to send me away. Why me? she wondered. Why me? Am I the public conscience, expected always to say in cold words what the rest of them are too arrogant to recognize? Am I supposed to be the weakest, weaker than Theodora? Of all of us, she thought, I am surely the one least likely to turn against the others. Poltergeists are another thing altogether, the doctor said, his eyes resting briefly on Eleanor. They deal entirely with the physical world. They throw stones, they move objects, they smash dishes. Mrs. Foister at Borley Rectory was a long-suffering woman, but she finally lost her temper entirely when her best teapot was hurled through the window. Poltergeists, however, are rock-bottom on the supernatural social scale. They are destructive, but mindless and willless. They are merely undirected force. Do you recall, he asked with a certain little smile, Oscar Wilde's lovely story, The Canterville Ghost? The American twins who routed the fine old English ghost, Theodora said. Exactly. I've always liked the notion that the American twins were actually a poltergeist phenomenon. Certainly poltergeists can overshadow any more interesting manifestation. Bad ghosts drive out good. And he patted his hands happily. They drive out everything else too, he added. There's a manor in Scotland infested with poltergeists where as many as 17 spontaneous fires have broken out in one day. Poltergeists like to turn people out of bed violently by tipping the bed end over end, and I remember the case of a minister who was forced to leave his home because he was tormented day after day by a poltergeist who hurled at his head hymn books stolen from a rival church. Suddenly, without reason, laughter trembled inside Eleanor. She wanted to run to the head of the table and hug the doctor. She wanted to reel, chanting across the stretches of the lawn. She wanted to sing and to shout and to fling her arms and move in great emphatic, possessing circles around the rooms of Hill House. I am here. I am here, she thought. She shut her eyes quickly in delight and then said demurely to the doctor, And what do we do today? You're still like a pack of children, the doctor said, smiling too. Always asking me what to do today. Can't you amuse yourselves with your toys or with each other? I have work to do. All I really want to do, and Theodora giggled, is slide down that banister. The excited gaiety had caught her as it had Eleanor. Hide and seek, Luke said. Try not to wander around alone too much, the doctor said. I can't think of a good reason why not, but it does seem sensible. Because there are bears in the woods, Theodora said. And tigers in the attic, Eleanor said. And an old witch in the tower and a dragon in the drawing room. I'm quite serious, the doctor said, laughing. It's ten o'clock. I clear. Good morning, Mrs. Dudley, the doctor said. And Eleanor and Theodora and Luke leaned back and laughed helplessly. I clear at ten o'clock. We won't keep you long. About fifteen minutes, please, and then you can clear the table. I clear breakfast at ten o'clock. I set on lunch at one. Dinner I set on at six. It's ten o'clock. Mrs. Dudley, the doctor began sternly, and then, noticing Luke's face tight with silent laughter, lifted his napkin to cover his eyes and gave in. You may clear the table, Mrs. Dudley, the doctor said brokenly. Happily, the sound of their laughter echoing along the halls of Hill House and carrying to the marble group in the drawing room and the nursery upstairs and the odd little top to the tower, they made their way down the passage to their parlour and fell, still laughing, into chairs. We must not make fun of Mrs. Dudley, the doctor said, and leaned forward, his face in his hands and his shoulders shaking. They laughed for a long time, speaking now and then in half phrases, trying to tell one another something, pointing at one another wildly, and their laughter rocked Hill House until, weak and aching, they lay back, spent, and regarded one another. Now, the doctor began, and was stopped by a little giggling burst from Theodora. Now, the doctor said again more severely, and they were quiet. I want more coffee, he said appealing. Don't we all? You mean go right in there and ask, Mrs. Dudley? Eleanor asked. Walk right up to her when it isn't one o'clock or six o'clock and just ask her for some coffee, Theodora demanded. Roughly, yes, the doctor said. Luke, my boy, I have observed that you are already something of a favourite with Mrs. Dudley. And how, Luke inquired with amazement, did you ever manage to observe anything so unlikely? Mrs. Dudley regards me with the same particular loathing she gives a dish not properly on its shelf. In Mrs. Dudley's eyes... 
You are, after all, the heir to the house, the doctor said coaxingly. Mrs. Dudley must feel for you as an old family retainer feels for the young master. In Mrs. Dudley's eyes, I am something lower than a dropped fork. I beg of you, if you are contemplating asking the old fool for something, send Theo or our charming Nell. They are not afraid. Nope, Theodora said. You can't send a helpless female to face down Mrs. Dudley. Nell and I are here to be protected, not to man the battlements for you cowards. The doctor. Nonsense, the doctor said heartily. You certainly wouldn't think of asking me, an older man. Anyway, you know she adores you. Insolent grey beard, Luke said. Sacrificing me for a cup of coffee? Do not be surprised, and I said darkly, do not be surprised if you lose your Luke in this cause. Perhaps Mrs. Dudley has not yet had her own mid-morning snack, and she is perfectly capable of a filet de Luc à la Meunier, or perhaps du poise, depending upon her mood, if I do not return. And he shook his finger warningly under the doctor's nose. I entreat you to regard your lunch with the gravest suspicion. Bowing extravagantly, as befitted one off to slay a giant, he closed the door behind him. Lovely Luke, Theodora stretched luxuriously. Lovely Hill House, Helena said. Theo, there's a kind of little summer house in the side garden, all overgrown. I noticed it yesterday. Can we explore it this morning? Delighted, Theodora said. I would not like to leave one inch of Hill House uncherished. Anyway, it's too nice a day to stay inside. We'll ask Luke to come too, Helena said. And you, Doctor? My notes... The doctor began and then stopped as the door opened so suddenly that in Eleanor's mind was only the thought that Luke had not dared face Mrs. Dudley after all, but had stood, waiting, pressed against the door. Then, looking at his white face and hearing the doctor say with fury, I broke my own first rule, I sent him alone, she found herself only asking urgently, Luke, Luke? It's all right, Luke even smiled, but come into the long hallway. Chilled by his face and his voice and his smile, they got up silently and followed him through the doorway into the dark, long hallway, which led back to the front hall. Here, Luke said, and a little winding shiver of sickness went down Eleanor's back when she saw that he was holding a lighted match up to the wall. It's writing, Eleanor asked, pressing closer to see. Writing, Luke said. I didn't even notice it until I was coming back. Mrs. Dudley said no, he added, his voice tight. My flash. The doctor took his flashlight from his pocket, and under its light, as he moved slowly from one end of the hall to the other, the letters stood out clearly. Chalk, the doctor said, stepping forward to touch a letter with the tip of his finger. Written in chalk. The writing was large and straggling, and ought to have looked, Eleanor thought, as though it had been scribbled by bad boys on a fence. Instead, it was incredibly real, going in broken lines over the thick panelling of the hallway. From one end of the hallway to the others, the letters went, almost too large to read, even when she stood back against the opposite wall. "'Can you read it?' Luke asked softly, and the doctor, moving his flashlight, read slowly. Help, Eleanor, come home. No. And Eleanor felt the words stop in her throat. She had seen her name as the doctor read it. It is me, she thought. It is my name standing out there so clearly. I should not be on the walls of this house. Wipe it off, please, she said, and felt Theodora's arm go around her shoulder. It's crazy, Eleanor said, bewildered. Crazy is the word, all right, Theodora said strongly. Come back inside, Nell, and sit down. Luke will get something and wipe it off. But it's crazy, Eleanor said, hanging back to see her name on the wall. Why? Firmly, the doctor put her through the door into the little parlour and closed it. Luke had already attacked the message with his handkerchief. Now, you listen to me, the doctor said to Eleanor. Just because your name... That's it, Eleanor said, staring at him. It knows my name, doesn't it? It knows my name. Shut up, will you? Theodora shook her violently. It could have said any one of us. It knows all our names. Did you write it? Eleanor turned to Theodora. Please tell me. I won't be angry or anything, just so I can know that maybe it was only a joke to frighten me. She looked appealingly at the doctor. You know that none of us wrote it, the doctor said. 
Luke came in, wiping his hands on his handkerchief, and Eleanor turned hopefully. Luke, she said, you wrote it, didn't you, when you went out? Luke stared and then came to sit on the arm of her chair. Listen, he said. Do you want me to go writing your name everywhere? Carving your initials on trees? Writing Eleanor, Eleanor on little scraps of paper? He gave her hair a soft little pull. I've got more sense, he said. Behave yourself. Then why me? Eleanor said, looking from one of them to another. I am outside, she thought madly. I am the one chosen. And she said quickly, beggingly, Did I do something to attract attention more than anyone else? No more than usual, dear, Theodora said. She was standing by the fireplace, leaning on the mantel and tapping her fingers, and when she spoke she looked at Eleanor with a bright smile. Maybe you wrote it yourself. Angry, Eleanor almost shouted. You think I want to see my name scribbled all over this foul house? You think I like the idea that I'm the centre of attention? I'm not the spoiled baby. After all, I don't like being singled out. Asking for help, did you notice? Theodora said lightly. Perhaps the spirit of the poor little companion has found a means of communication at last. Maybe she was only waiting for some drab, timid... Maybe it was only addressed to me because no possible appeal for help could get through that iron selfishness of yours. Maybe I might have had more sympathy and understanding in one minute than you... And maybe, of course, you wrote it yourself, Theodora said again. After the manner of men who see women quarrelling, the doctor and Luke had withdrawn, standing tight together in miserable silence. Now at last Luke moved and spoke. "'That's enough, Eleanor,' he said unbelievably. And Eleanor whirled around, stamping. "'How dare you!' she said, gasping. "'How dare you!' And the doctor laughed then, and she stared at him, and then at Luke, who was smiling and watching her. "'What is wrong with me?' she thought. Then... But they think Theodora did it on purpose, made me mad so I wouldn't be frightened. How shameful to be manoeuvred in that way. She covered her face and sat down in her chair. Nell, dear, Theodora said, I am sorry. I must say something, Eleanor told herself. I must show them that I'm a good sport, after all, a good sport. Let them think that I'm ashamed of myself. I'm sorry, she said. I was frightened. Of course you were, the doctor said. And Eleanor thought, how simple he is, how transparent. He believes every silly thing he has ever heard. He thinks even that Theodora shocked me out of hysteria. She smiled at him and thought, now I am back in the fold. I really thought you were going to start shrieking, Theodora said, coming to kneel by Eleanor's chair. I would have in your place, but we can't afford to have you break up, you know. We can't afford to have anyone but Theodora in the centre of the stage, Eleanor thought. If Eleanor is going to be the outsider, she is going to be it all alone. She reached out and patted Theodora's head and said, Thanks. I guess I was kind of shaky for a minute. I wondered if you two were going to come to blows, Luke said, until I realised what Theodora was doing. Smiling down into Theodora's bright, happy eyes, Eleanor thought, But that isn't what Theodora was doing at all. Time passed lazily at Hill House. Eleanor and Theodora, the Doctor and Luke, alert against terror, wrapped around by the rich hills and securely set into the warm, dark luxuries of the house, were permitted a quiet day and a quiet night, enough, perhaps, to dull them a little. They took their meals together, and Mrs. Dudley's cooking stayed perfect. They talked together and played chess. The Doctor finished Pamela and began on Sir Charles Grandison, a compelling need for occasional privacy led them to spend some hours alone in their separate rooms without disturbance. Theodora and Eleanor and Luke explored the tangled thicket behind the house and found the little summer house, while the doctor sat on the wide lawn writing within sight and hearing. They found a walled-in rose garden, grown over with weeds, and a vegetable garden tenderly nourished by the Dudleys. They spoke often of arranging their picnic by the brook. There were wild strawberries near the summer house and Theodora and Eleanor and Luke brought back a handkerchief full and lay on the lawn near the doctor, eating them, staining their hands and their mouths, like children, the doctor told them, looking up with amusement from his notes. Each of them had written, carelessly and with little attention to detail, an account of what they thought they had seen and heard so far in Hill House, and the doctor had put the papers away in his portfolio. The next morning, their third morning in Hill House, the doctor, aided by Luke, 
had spent a loving and maddening hour on the floor of the upstairs hall, trying with chalk and measuring tape to determine the precise dimensions of the cold spot, while Eleanor and Theodora sat cross-legged on the hall floor, noting down the doctor's measurements and playing tic-tac-toe. The doctor was considerably hampered in his work by the fact that his hands repeatedly chilled by the extreme cold. He could not hold either the chalk or the tape for more than a minute at a time. Luke, inside the nursery doorway, could hold one end of the tape until his hand came into the cold spot, and then his fingers lost strength and relaxed helplessly. The thermometer dropped into the centre of the cold spot, refused to register any change at all, but continued doggedly maintaining that the temperature there was the same as the temperature down the rest of the hall, causing the doctor to fume wildly against the statisticians of Borley Rectory, who had caught an eleven-degree drop. When he had defined the cold spot as well as he could, and noted his results in his notebook, he brought them downstairs for lunch and issued a general challenge to them to meet him at croquet in the cool of the afternoon. It seems foolish, he explained, to spend a morning as glorious as this has been looking at a frigid place on the floor. We must plan to spend more time outside, and was mildly surprised when they laughed. Is there still a world somewhere? Eleanor asked wonderingly. Mrs. Dudley had made them a peach shortcake, and she looked down at her plate and said, I'm sure Mrs. Dudley goes somewhere else at night, and she brings back heavy cream each morning, and Dudley comes up with groceries every afternoon, but as far as I can remember, there's no other place than this. We are on a desert island, Luke said. I can't picture any world but Hill House, Eleanor said. Perhaps, Theodora said. We should make notches on a stick or pile pebbles in a heap one each day so we will know how long we've been marooned. How pleasant not to have any word from outside. Luke helped himself to an enormous heap of whipped cream. No letters, no newspapers, anything might be happening. Unfortunately, the doctor said and then stopped. I beg your pardon, he went on. I meant only to say that word will be reaching us from outside, and of course it is not unfortunate at all. Mrs. Montague, my wife, that is, will be here on Saturday. But when is Saturday? Luke asked. Delighted to see Mrs. Montague, of course. Day after tomorrow, the doctor thought. Yes, he said after a minute. I believe that the day after tomorrow is Saturday. We will know it is Saturday, of course, he told them with a little twinkle, because Mrs. Montague will be here. Hope she's not holding high hopes of things going bump in the night, Theodora said. Hill House has fallen far short of its original promise, I think. Or perhaps Mrs. Montague will be greeted with a volley of psychic experiences. Mrs. Montague, the doctor said, will be perfectly ready to receive them. I wonder, Theodora said to Eleanor as they left the lunch table under Mrs. Dudley's watchful eye, why everything has been so quiet. I think this waiting is nerve-wracking almost worse than having something happen. It is not us doing the waiting, Eleanor said. It's the house. I think it's biding its time. Waiting until we feel secure, maybe, and then it will pounce. I wonder how long it can wait. Eleanor shivered and started up the great staircase. I'm almost tempted to write a letter to my sister. You know, having a perfectly splendid time here in jolly old Hill House. You really must plan to bring the whole family next summer. Theodora went on. We sleep under blankets every night. The air is so bracing, particularly in the upstairs hall. You go around all the time just glad to be alive. There's something going on every minute. Civilization seems so far away. Eleanor laughed. She was ahead of Theodora at the top of the stairs. The dark hallway was a little lighted this afternoon because they had left the nursery door open and the sunlight came through the windows by the tower and touched the doctor's measuring tape and chalk on the floor. The light reflected from the stained-glass window on the stair landing and made shattered fragments of blue and orange and green on the dark wood of the hall. I'm going to sleep, she said. I've never been so lazy in my life. I'm going to lie on my bed and dream about street cars, Theodora said. It had become Eleanor's habit to hesitate in the doorway of her room, glancing around quickly before she went inside. She told herself that this was because the room was so exceedingly blue and always took a moment to get used to. When she came inside, she went across to open the window, which she always found closed. Today she was halfway across the room before she heard Theodora's door slam back and Theodora's smothered, Eleanor! Moving quickly, Eleanor ran into the hall into Theodora's doorway to stop, aghast looking over Theodora's shoulder. What is it? she whispered. What does it look like? Theodora's voice rose crazily. What does it look like, you fool? 
and I won't forgive her for that either, Eleanor thought concretely through her bewilderment. It looks like paint, she said hesitantly, except, realizing, except the smell is awful. It's blood, Theodora said with finality. She clung to the door, swaying as the door moved, staring. Blood, she said, all over. Do you see it? Of course I see it, and it's not all over. Stop making such a fuss. Although, she thought conscientiously, Theodora was making very little of a fuss, actually. One of these times, she thought, one of us is going to put her head back and really howl, and I hope it won't be me, because I'm trying to guard against it. It will be Theodora who... And then, cold, she asked, Is there more writing on the wall? And heard Theodora's wild laugh and thought, Maybe it will be me, after all, and I can't afford to. I must be steady. And she closed her eyes and found herself saying silently, Oh, stay and hear your true love's coming that can sing both high and low. Trip no further, pretty sweeting, journey's end in lover's meeting. Yes, indeed, dear, Theodora said. I don't know how you managed it. Every wise man's son doth know. Be sensible, Eleanor said. Call Luke and the doctor. Why? Theodora asked. Wasn't it to be just a little private surprise for me? A secret just for the two of us? Then, pulling away from Eleanor, who tried to hold her from going further into the room, she ran to the great wardrobe and threw open the door and cruelly began to cry, My clothes! she said, My clothes! Steadily, Eleanor turned and went to the top of the stairs. Luke! she called, leaning over the banisters. Doctor! Her voice was not loud, and she had tried to keep it level. But she heard the doctor's book drop to the floor, and then the pounding of feet as he and Luke ran for the stairs. She watched them, seeing their apprehensive faces, wondering at the uneasiness which lay so close below the surface in all of them, so that each of them seemed always waiting for a cry for help from one of the others. Intelligence and understanding are really no protection at all, she thought. It's Theo, she said as they came to the top of the stairs. She's hysterical. Someone, something, has gotten red paint in her room and she's crying over her clothes. Now I could not have put it more fairly than that, she thought, turning to follow them. Could I have put it more fairly than that? she asked herself, and found that she was smiling. Theodora was still sobbing wildly in her room and kicking at the wardrobe door in a tantrum that might have been laughable if she had not been holding her yellow shirt, matted and stained. Her other clothes had been torn from the hangers and lay trampled and disordered on the wardrobe floor, all of them smeared and reddened. What is it? Luke asked the doctor, and the doctor, shaking his head, said, I would swear that it was blood. And yet to get so much blood, one would almost have to... And then it was abruptly quiet. All of them stood in silence for a moment and looked at Help Eleanor Come Home, Eleanor, written in shaky red letters on the wallpaper over Theodora's bed. This time I'm ready, Eleanor told herself and said, You'd better get her out of here. Bring her into my room. My clothes are ruined, Theodora said to the doctor. Do you see my clothes? The smell was atrocious, and the writing on the wall had dripped and splattered. There was a line of drops from the wall to the wardrobe, perhaps what had first turned Theodora's attention that way, and a great irregular stain on the green rug. It's disgusting, Eleanor said. Please get Theo into my room. Luke and the doctor between them persuaded Theodora through the bathroom and into Eleanor's room, and Eleanor, looking at the red paint, it must be paint, she told herself. It's simply got to be paint. What else could it be? Said aloud, But why? And stared up at the writing on the wall. Here lies one, she thought gracefully, whose name was writ in blood. Is it possible that I am not quite coherent at this moment? Is she all right? She asked, turning as the doctor came back into the room. She will be in a few minutes. We'll have to move her in with you for a while, I should think. I can't imagine her wanting to sleep in here again. The doctor smiled a little wanly. It will be a long time, I think, before she opens another door by herself. I suppose she'll have to wear my clothes. I suppose she will, if you don't mind. The doctor looked at her curiously. This message troubles you less than the other. It's too silly, Eleanor said, trying to understand her own feelings. I've been standing here looking at it and just wondering why. I mean, it's like a joke that didn't come off. I was supposed to be much more frightened than this, I think, and I'm not because it's simply too horrible to be real. And I keep remembering Theo putting red polish, she giggled, and the doctor looked at her sharply, but she went on. 
It might as well be paint, don't you see? I can't stop talking, she thought. What do I have to explain in all this? Maybe I can't take it seriously, she said. After the sight of Theo screaming over her poor clothes and accusing me of writing my name all over her wall, maybe I'm getting used to her blaming me for everything. Nobody's blaming you for anything, the doctor said, and Eleanor felt that she had been reproved. I hope my clothes will be good enough for her, she said tartly. The doctor turned, looking around the room. He touched one finger gingerly to the letters on the wall and moved Theodora's yellow shirt with his foot. Later, he said absently, tomorrow perhaps. He glanced at Eleanor and smiled. I can make an exact sketch of this, he said. I can help you, Eleanor said. It makes me sick, but it doesn't frighten me. Yes, the doctor said. I think we'd better close up the room for now, however. We don't want Theodora blundering in here again. Then later, at my leisure, I can study it. Also, he said with a flash of amusement, I would not like to have Mrs. Dudley coming in here to straighten up. Eleanor watched silently while he locked the hall door from inside the room, and then they went through the bathroom and he locked the connecting door into Theodora's green room. I'll see about moving in another bed, he said, and then, with some awkwardness, you've kept your head well, Eleanor. It's a help to me. I told you it makes me sick, but it doesn't frighten me, she said, pleased, and turned to Theodora. Theodora was lying on Eleanor's bed, and Eleanor saw with a queasy turn that Theodora had gotten red on her hands and it was rubbing off on Eleanor's pillow. Look, she said harshly, coming over to Theodora, you'll have to wear my clothes until you get new ones or until we get the others cleaned. Cleaned? Theodora rolled convulsively on the bed and pressed her stained hands against her eyes. Cleaned? For heaven's sake, Eleanor said, let me wash you off. She thought, without trying to find a reason, that she had never felt such uncontrollable loathing for any person before, and she went into the bathroom and soaked a towel and came back to scrub roughly at Theodora's hands and face. You're filthy with the stuff, she said, hating to touch Theodora. Suddenly Theodora smiled at her. I don't really think you did it, she said, and Eleanor turned to see that Luke was behind her, looking down at them. What a fool I am, Theodora said to him. And Luke laughed. You will be a delight in Nell's red sweater, he said. She is wicked, Eleanor thought, beastly and soiled and dirty. She took the towel into the bathroom and left it to soak in cold water. When she came out, Luke was saying, Another bed in here. You girls are going to share a room from now on. Share a room and share our clothes, Theodora said. We're going to be practically twins. Cousins, Eleanor said but no one heard her.